In this segment, we're going to talk about the forward-backward algorithm. The forward-backward algorithm is going to allow us to compute the marginal distribution of a CR of a sequential CRF, uh, the distribution over a particular yi conditioned on the input. So we have to do this by summing out all of the other y's because the model doesn't like it doesn't place like a distribution over each y that all get producted together or anything like that. The model is, is so-called globally normalized, meaning that it places this global distribution over the y's, and the only way to get these marginals is to take that big distribution and sum out pieces of it. So the nice thing is that it's going to look not so different from Viterbi. What Viterbi did was we uh, computed, it allowed us to compute the uh, kind of best uh, sequence y max by maxing over y1 through yn. So here we're doing something a little bit different. We're summing out things instead of maxing, and we're summing out kind of most of those, but leaving one in the middle. Um, but the same ideas about dynamic programming are, go are going to apply here. So the basic idea is the following. So we have this node here uh, in the middle um, at time step three. So what we can ask is, what is the probability that y3, the tag at step three, uh, equals two. So we our, our tags in this case are integers, and uh, we want to know what that probability is. The way to think about this is that it's the sum of all paths through state two at time t, or rather the kind of probability mass associated with all those paths, divided by the the kind of sum over all those paths, or if we think if we're thinking about it in terms of probability, um, you know, just one because all the paths have to sum to one. So when I say paths that go through this state, um, we have one shown here on the left, and here's another. We need to think about summing over all of these, and then uh, also considering the paths that don't go through this state. So. Uh, we have this sort of teal uh, structure, which represents all the paths that do go through this state, and we have to compute the sum of scores for that and divide by the overall sum of scores. Uh, and what this is going to allow us to do is it'll allow us to actually turn um, these unnormalized potential factors into this probability that we need. And so the way that we're going to do this is by having one dynamic programming pass that computes this first chunk, that's the forward pass, and a second that computes the second chunk, that's the backward pass. All right, so what's happening in forward? So this is going to look very similar to Viterbi. We start off, uh, we're going to call alpha our forward uh, scores, and our first alpha is just the exponential of the emissions at the first time step. And then our recurrence here is going to sum, so we're not maxing anymore, we're summing, but we're summing over something that looks very similar to what we had in Viterbi. We have alpha t minus one, so the alpha values from the previous time step associated with this state that we're looking back at, s t minus one. And then we have our emissions at the current time step. So this could technically be factored outside of the sum as well, um, as well as our transition from the previous state to the current state. So again, you know, this looks very much like Viterbi, with the main differences being that we've we've kind of swapped probabilities for these potentials now, and we've uh, we're summing instead of maxing. And so I'm showing this in uh, kind of real probability space. Um, but just like with Viterbi, where we implemented everything in terms of log probabilities, we want to do that here as well, because the otherwise the probabilities get very small, and you risk underflowing when you have long sentences. Um, although typically for any R, you don't run into that problem so much. You can, you can usually kind of get away with doing it in real space. All right. Uh, the backward recurrence is going to be the same kind of idea, just in reverse. Um, 
The one key difference is that in the recurrence here, the emission features that we are using are based on the next time step rather than the current time step. All right, and that is reflected in the initial distribution as well, which doesn't look at the emissions for the last step, but instead just says, okay, you know, uh, assign, like just assign a placeholder value of one everywhere here. Uh, so the, this, is a, this is an important distinction from the forward algorithm, and we're gonna see uh, in a little bit why this is important. All right, so we have these two recurrences here. Um, so following the dynamic programming idea, we kind of iterate up in one direction and compute forward, and then we iterate back and compute backward. Um, you can do these, these in either order or in parallel or, or whatever, it doesn't matter. But we need to compute these alphas and betas. All right, now for actually computing this uh, probability here, we need to, uh, we compute it as follows. We take alpha and beta associated with that particular state. So remember, we're thinking at state state at time step three, uh, you know, state two. So alpha three of two times beta three of two. And then we divide by the sum over the alphas and betas at that time step, uh, summing out over all of the i's. All right. So a couple of things. First is that now we understand why beta doesn't account for the current time step. And the reason is, if we did, we would be double counting the emissions at time step three. If we define beta exactly like alpha, we would essentially have that term be showing up twice. But instead, the way we kind of think about it is that the alphas are uh, keeping track of like the probabilities here, and the betas are only keeping track of these probabilities. And you should be able to convince yourself that all the terms are accounted for. Like we do get all the transitions in there and we do get all the emissions in there without double counting. All right. And the last detail is this denominator thing. This is a little bit weird. Turns out this denominator equals P of X. And the reason is because we are summing over all the possible states that we could be going through at this time step. And once we sum all those up, it turns out we end up with the purple thing, which is just the sum over all the possible paths through the state space. So you, there's actually many ways to compute this denominator. You can compute it at any possible time step, um, and it should always give the same value, which is a very good way to sanity check that your implementation of this is correct. All right, so we, uh, We've talked about this, uh, you know, here's our, here's our kind of calling back to our, our definition here. Um, and our uh, normalizing constant z, this is what we were able to, uh, we were able to compute. So this is analogous to p of x for HMMs. Um, and the sum over all paths equals this z. So for both HMMs and CRFs, it's the case that uh, you can compute this, uh, these marginal probabilities in this way. So we didn't have any reason to do this in the HMM case, uh, but we are doing it now. And uh, the denominator here is gonna be Z for CRFs and P of X for HMM. So I should have mentioned on the previous slide that um, the, what, what we're really computing in the CRF case is Z here, um, and the, the P of X is really applicable to the HMM case. And again, this is a nice way to, uh, to help debug your implementation. All right, so I wanna kinda close out here by thinking about the difference between these posterior distributions and probabilities. So we're computing these P of YI equals S conditioned on X. And this posterior distribution is derived from both the parameters and the data point X. Um, and this is very different from the distributions inside an HMM. We have these emissions and transitions that are actually model parameters. They're like sort of defined by, uh, you know, they're defined inside the model. The uh, posteriors over uh, 
emissions and transitions, these, these kind of marginalized posteriors, uh, these are inferred using forward backward. So we would have to do that in the HMM case as well. In CRFs, emissions and transitions don't exist. It doesn't even make sense to talk about these quantities because that's not how the model is defined. We can still talk about, however, these posterior probabilities and their, their marginalized versions because those can be inferred from forward backward. The, mo the model is defined. It can talk about P of Y given X, and then we can sum out over Ys. So that's totally fine. So this hopefully helps shed a little bit of light on uh, when we're kind of pushing around these different distributions, why some of them are so different. Some of them are just defined a priori, and some of them have to be computed through these very intricate dynamic programs. And that's sort of what's going on here. So this segment showed you how forward-backward can be used to compute these quantities that we need, uh, and that fits the last piece into the puzzle of CRF learning and inference here. And that's it for this segment.